Hello. We couldn't think of an intro for this show. So here it is. Enjoy. Or don't. I really couldn't care. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are back after a long hiatus, as you do at the end of a very long and arduous season. We took a break as well, but we're back here to bring you all content. And by content, I mean stuff that we remembered to actually write down to talk about. Welcome in to the Orlando Soccer Show. My name is Austin David. The guy on the other side of the computer is Gavin Eubank. And yeah, it's it's been a uh, it's been a month since we talked last. The last time we talked was James O'Connor's firing, so we figured it's it's about time to come back and discuss things that's going on. Yeah, I mean, it's been a month, pretty much a month to the day that we're recording this that James was fired and we last uh, got together for this and not much has happened since then, especially not much in Orlando soccer has happened. So, you know, it, if you have missed us, we apologize, but just know that we do not want to give you half-filled shows. We are a full content show only. No drip feeds in this one. <laughs> Watch us give, like, half content in this one. Now, actually, we, <laughs> we've got a lot to talk about. First off, the main thing is stuff that's happened to, to us, because you care, since the last time we recorded. Gavin, you got married. I did. I am uh, now one of those lonely or sad old married men. At at what? Just, 20, 20, just kidding. 24? Don't tell my wife that. Yes. How old are 23. you? 23. 23. Yeah. Sad old man at 23. Yes. Yes. Look where your life has gone, Gavin. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. Anyways. <laughs> If you hear anything in the background while I am currently recording, it's because my house is getting mutilated. Um, it, it's got a construction crew all around it, and uh, they, they've literally woke me up at 7 in the morning uh, one day with a buzzsaw coming through my wall. So that that's fun. Uh, hopefully that does not happen today. So in the meantime, let's get into the nitty-gritty. Let's talk about content. James O'Connor was fired almost a month ago to the day. And uh, he has uh, moved on. He's back in Louisville now, um, enjoying his time off. And uh, before he left, I actually got to go have a, a nice chat with him. Uh, I don't have any audio because I didn't record anything. and It was just a, a personal chat between us. And he's, he was doing good. Like, you know, genuinely kind of uh, almost relieved in a way. Like, a, a weight was lifted from his shoulders. It kind of just, he was, like, a bit more freed. You know, talking to him, he was happy to have a break. He said this was his first break from football in 20 years because he's gone from playing, playing, playing to then coming over to Orlando, playing, playing, and then at the very beginning of the 2014 season, going and becoming a coach and then coaching, scouting, preparing for basically every year of his career up until Orlando when they fire him, which was really his first job he was fired from. And now he's just going to enjoy his time off. He visited some family that he hasn't seen in a long time. He met, uh, I think, what was his sister's kids who he'd never met before. Yeah, he's he's just been enjoying life, and uh, he will continue to enjoy life until such a time that uh, a team comes calling for him. You know, he's he's not preparing anything right now he's not got anything in the works he's just enjoying his time off with his kids and his wife and uh yeah he's uh back back in louisville now uh enjoying all of that yeah and louisville is uh playing in the usl championship so i'm sure he'll be out there to to take that in that'll be a nice little uh little welcome back to louisville i'm sure yeah and and you know the players still credit him for like building the culture over there and everything yeah. So it's it's still kind of James's team in a in a way, uh, because of you know the the roster that he built. But yeah, I mean it's only been a year since he's been gone too. So. I know, <clears throat> I know, and and he left kind of at a, a not a great time in the season last year, but they still ended up going on and winning the entire thing, and this year they could very well do it again. For and what would be what, their what third or fourth championship? Third, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. When you think about how many teams are in USL, how big it's grown in the last five years, the fact that Louisville is still 
doing it year after year is really impressive. Like, well, you, you, you know, a lot of credit. You, you know what it is, Gavin. It's because what? Orlando City's rights are being held by Louisville. That's true. So they have the spirit of Orlando City there in Louisville. And literally the purple. Yep. It's it's They're literally all just bundled together. For And obviously for a while, Wayne Espinola. Espinola? Espinola? What? Wayne Espinola? He was... Estopinol. Estopinol. I don't know. One of those. He was the owner of Louisville and obviously was also a part owner of Orlando City up until his passing earlier this year yeah you know it was interesting i i don't think anyone's really mentioned this um orlando city actually you know they they did send out their condolences because wayne was a big part of the uh founding of orlando city they actually dedicated a box up on the third floor uh to him the, yeah, I did not the, know the wayne estopano uh suite <laughs> and i, I passed cool. it i passed it every time i walked into the press box and i'm like oh that's really cool. I should probably say something about that. And then I keep forgetting to say something about that. So I'm glad you brought that up much. Anyway, it's the spirit of Orlando City that's living on in Louisville. So every time they win, Orlando City wins or something. I don't know. Orlando City kind of inherited the Chivas USA spirit. If you think about of it. being sad all the time and always losing. Yeah, no, no. Kind of like, um, <laughs> kind of like that. But, I, I mean, if you really think about it, Orlando City's, like, the only reason that they came into the league, well, one of the reasons, was because of Chivas USA folding. Is that the reason they came into the league? It's not the, it's not the reason. It's I mean, just, they happened to come in at the same time. Yes. Right. I don't know. Maybe maybe Orlando City technically inherited the Chivas USA rights in a, in a roundabout way and then inherited their spirit of sad and losing. It's possible. Mm. I was thinking about it the other day. Now that Seattle is in the MLS Cup for the third time in four years, kind of like the parallels to what Orlando City could have been and what was Orlando City was trying to be when they came to MLS. Like that whole, they obviously have the passionate fan base, the club connection from ownership all the way down to the fans, the players. Like they all, it just feels like everybody is in it together. And that's kind of where Orlando City was. And then obviously, as that all went away, things have only gotten worse. It's disappointing to think about, but, you know, it feels like there's a lot of parallels there hey, into hey, what could have been. G- Gavin, Gavin. Hmm. I am the type of person that doesn't talk negative. <laughs> oh, we only we only say positive things on this podcast. I, I apologize. Yeah, come on now. Come on now, Gavin. <clears throat> Anyways. That's my fault. That was our little talk about James and Orlando City and uh, such. So now that James is gone, they need a new coach. Not too much news on that front. There was uh, some rumors flying around about certain coaches that didn't end up coming to fruition. But now, there's a new one, and this one looks kind of promising. Oscar Pereja to Orlando City. Woo. Does that make you excited? Who hasn't seen this coming since the day Luis Muzi was hired? Well, I mean, there was a lot of questions of if it could happen because Pereja was kind of under contract with a different team and still is. Yeah, I so mean, there's, here's there's what we no know guarantee. at the moment is that, he, yeah, like you said, he's still under contract. The Cholos have not fired him. They have not let him go. He's still coaching for them. And we also don't know if Pereja even wants to come to orlando or mls obviously he's only been gone for what like two years not even so mm-hmm. i mean i don't know if it, it, it would seem kind of odd to go from a place with so much stability so much promise so many resources like dallas go to go to liga Mackies for such a short period of time and then come back to a place in orlando city where you're, you're essentially rebuilding a club from scratch at this point it, it doesn't Makes sense to me. It's not an, an unfathomable thing to see him coming back to work Louis, with Muzi, but it just seems kind of weird from his perspective as to why he would want to do that. Uh, I can tell you one reason why. Dollar dollar bills. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the I mean the whole reasoning behind this is that he would get a raise from what he's getting currently in right in Mexico. And yeah, I mean. And he gets sense. to work with someone that he's worked with before. 
yeah. in terms of building a roster. Now, here's the thing, like, I don't know, you just don't know the stability here because if Orlando struggles and <laughs> Luis Muzi goes out the door, then, like, where does that leave Pereja? So, I mean, he I could just know, straight up just, quit if he wanted to. Yeah, I mean, it's like, just the, I, I'm sure. Door. I'm sure that for where Pereja has gotten to this point, if he leaves Orlando City, there will be a job waiting for him somewhere else. Like, someone will offer him a job somewhere else. Absolutely. You're kind of mortgaging your future on the Muzi pareja combination. Which isn't a bad thing. You know, they had a lot of success in Dallas. Yeah. Of course, Muzi was the, he wasn't the, like, full-time GM. He was the assistant GM. But still, he was very much involved in the process. Uh-huh. And yeah. there could be something there. You know, I, I know for sure, and, and uh, the mainland had this first. We got to give them the, the credit for having the Pareja story first. He is their first choice candidate. And he does have a contract offer waiting for him. The only question right now is, will he take it? Right. Because we could say Jose Mourinho has a contract offer waiting for Orlando City, but that also doesn't mean he'd take it. So, like, there's still a lot up in the air right now. And apparently, Pereja, according to reports from uh, Mexico or, or some Latin outlet, is that he wants to wait until after the season ends to make a decision on that, which I believe it ends the 22nd of this month. So a few more weeks to go before, if we get a decision, um, or an announcement that Oscar Perez is the next coach for Orlando City. Right. And Orlando City is perfectly fine with that. Yeah, I mean, which, of course, it still leaves you plenty of time in the offseason to do something, but you will have missed a few key offseason dates by that point if he takes over within the week following the end of that of the League MX season. So, I mean... Kind of. I mean, it could be, it, really, it very easily could be that he's already agreed. He just can't make an announcement right now because of his situation with the team. And he's already telling Luis Muzi, like, hey, go after this guy or, hey, look at this guy. That, but, I mean, that is also because Luis Muzi did the same thing when he was in Dallas, right? When he was making deals for Orlando City before he came over, allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. Allegedly. Not a proven fact or not. Anyway, right. it's 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 a tricky situation with with having no coach, but also having a GM. I think I would hope to think that Luis Muzi knows what kind of players Oscar Pereja would want for his team, yeah. and even if Pereja is is not officially official, it's certainly looking like he'll be the guy unless. They offer him a raise over in Mexico or something. I don't know if their campaign has really done anything. Like, Tijuana has been kind of meh. They're, like, middle of the pack right now in terms of uh, Liga MX. Yeah, and uh, they do have a history of, of rotating coaches in and out. But, like, as of everything I've seen, it doesn't appear he is on the hot seat. So, I mean, it, it'll be interesting. Yeah, well, they they they're currently, like... They're currently one. They've won three of their last three games. Yeah, they've got three games left in the season, or two games left. So they just played their last game on Sunday. They lost to Juarez three 0 Then they've got a game against uh, Monterey and Leon. Mm. That game is on the twenty second. Their last game of the season. Well, that's it. They've got Copa MX in January, but I mean by that time the decision will be made. So only right. two more games left. By the end of November, right around Thanksgiving, is when we could know if Orlando City is higher Pareja or not. Yeah, I mean, if you're Orlando City, this is... Obviously, if he is the number one candidate, it's ap- it's easy to see why. I mean, we've kind of already established that Orlando City is essentially going to follow that FC Dallas route where the academy is going to become a much bigger influence on the first team and developing players and not necessarily spending a ton of money. They'll still flash, you know, a designated player here and there like you see with Nani. But obviously, FC Dallas doesn't go out and get the biggest names on the market. They get valuable players for effective costs. And Luis, and, and Oscar Perea fits that. He has obviously shown at Dallas that he is very capable of working with young players, giving players minutes. 
Dallas is one of the best teams in the league in playing homegrown players. And you get a coach like Oscar Pereja here that can work with Orlando and Central Florida's vast talent of youth soccer. That could be a very good combination. And if this combo sticks around for a while, Orlando could finally start to look like they're going to be in pretty good shape for the long run. It excites me to see to to think about Oscar Pereja as the head coach. Because outside of that, he's a pretty good coach. Yeah. I only worry about what you've said before, the history of coaches here in Orlando, yeah. the history of GMs in Orlando, I guess, the, the kind of turnover a little bit. But right. uh, again... I am the type of person that doesn't talk negative. <laughs> only right. positive on this show right. today, guys. Right. Only okay? positive things. Only positive Say something positive, Gavin. The color purple is really good. The movie or the color? The color. Here's something positive. The Last Jedi was not a bad movie. Hot takes. What, the the Last Jedi wasn't a bad movie? Yes. It's not a hot take. I mean it is. I was gonna say it's a pretty scathing say. hot take of these days. Yeah, well, I agree. I'm excited for the last for the Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> I know a lot of people are like lukewarm on it after the Last Jedi, but I am I am excited for it. The thing, the thing, a quick tangent here off of soccer. The thing about a trilogy is you have to see how the trilogy ends before you judge the trilogy. Th- yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. Like, wait till the third movie comes out, then watch all three movies as a whole, as a group, as a collective, and then make your decision if you hate it or not. Yeah, I mean, they are three technically separate movies, but at the same time, it's all one big story. So we're only halfway through the story. We still have the ending to go. Yeah. If you're going to judge every little intricate detail about a movie, especially with Star Wars, you need to go back and do that with 4, 5, and 6. Because, I mean, they had a lot of intricate details that went wrong. And people chalk it up to, oh, well, it was an old movie or whatever. People just dissect things too intricately these days it's it's just enjoy the movie it's a it's a movie it's meant to be enjoyed don't overthink yeah. it all right moving on to our next topic which is college soccer gavin every single team in the central florida area is currently headed to the postseason Woo! that is some exciting stuff we'll start with ucf because they've been arguably the better teams in terms of soccer this year Men's, oh my goodness, they have been amazing. First off, they checked in at the last one of the last uh, post, you know, uh, polls in the season at number six in the nation. They've been undefeated in their last fifteen games. That's quite an impressive streak. And the crazy thing about this streak is that a lot of the games that they've played have been in overtime. So, imagine, like, college soccer games, they go to overtime, and it's golden goal. Whoever scores first wins. So, starting in the beginning of October, all but two games have gone to overtime, and four of them have gone to double overtime. How wild is that? That's crazy. Like, imagine, that, imagine. That, a lot and, of and UCF is UCF is not lost any of these games because they're undefeated in 15. They've tied one, which was against the number four team in the nation at the time, SMU. And that was back on the 6th of October. They beat FAU in overtime, 3-2. They beat Tulsa, 3-2, in double overtime. They beat UConn, 2-1, in overtime. The only game that didn't go, or one of the two games that didn't go to overtime was a 1-0 win against USF in Tampa. Then they beat Stetson, 3-2, in double overtime beat Memphis 1-0 in regular time. And then their most recent game back on November 5th, 3-2 double overtime win against Cincinnati in Ohio. So, their next schedule. In fact, next Wednesday, the 13th, they're going to be playing either Memphis or Temple in the semifinal of the American Athletic Conference Championship. Now, if they win that, They go to the final, which is on the 16th. All of these games, by the way, the entire tournament hosted in Orlando because UCF, best team. So if you want to go see some college soccer, it's in the area. 
starts on November 9th, this tournament. And it's all... Well, actually, these... these uh, I think these first two games are going to be at the campus sites, I want to say. Okay, yeah. So the first, the first couple games on Saturday the 9th, they're going to be at USF and Memphis, respectively. Then it's going to be on the 13th, which is the top four seeds. They're going to be held at US, UCF. So Wednesday the 13th, the semifinals, those both games will be at UCF. So whoever wins uh, from the first round will play SMU. That's between UConn and USF. And whoever wins between Temple and Memphis will play UCF. And both games will be at UCF. And then the final at UCF is going to be on ESPN3 at 7 o'clock on... Sunday this or Saturday the sixteenth. Is the women's final four in Orlando again this year? Because I don't remember the years that they announced that it was supposed to be here. It was either seventeen or eighteen or eighteen and nineteen. It's going to be in San Jose this year. Oh okay. At Avaya. It's. It feels like it, they've been doing it a lot there lately. It's I think a good the place men's to was do last it. year too. Yeah. yeah. The thing about. Uh, Orlando this year is they're hosting a bowl game in their stadium. Oh yeah, that's true. Shouldn't hmm. coincide actually because I think the the women's college cup will finish kind of towards the end of November, early December. So that's well before the actual bowl game, but they're probably going to want to set that up ahead of time. I'm I don't know. really like looking forward to seeing what a football game was going to look like officially at at Explorer Stadium. That's going to be interesting. It is, uh, it's definitely interesting, yeah. It's, um, I saw some of the pictures from the setup, and I've talked to some of the people over there. They're go- So what they're going to do, and this is, again, another quick tangent, but eh, well, why not? They're going to block out the first couple rows of the stadium, like the first two rows. I guess they're going to turn those into kind of like makeshift benches, or they're going to take out some of the seats in order to like put the players there or something, or the gear, because... Uh, uh, they don't. They're not 100 percent sure how much room there'll be in the sidelines. Also, they don't want people that close to the players, which is fair. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, they're gonna have like the the net uh, for the uh, goal uh, goal posts behind the goal posts. They'll be like hung up from using the um, the rigs for the tifo on one uh-huh. side, and uh-huh. I think they've got some rigs on the other side as well uh, that they can utilize for the other netting, so people won't get drilled in the face with footballs. Right. Huh. But yeah, they've kind of set this up uh, very nicely for that. Unfortunately, the head coach, the uh, head head coach, the head uh, groundskeeper Matt Burdrick, uh, he's gone to Miami, so uh, should be interesting to see how the field holds up after this game. Yeah, just uh, feels like everyone's going to Miami these days. Hey, Miami's Which, a pretty hot place to be. Uh, yeah, NBC just announced that they're doing their next uh, Premier League Fan Fest. In Miami, uh, December 14th to the 15th. That actually sounds like a lot of fun. They were just in Austin a couple weeks ago. And now, next is Miami. That's that's a weird shift. Well, I guess, yeah, yeah the, the new MLS teams uh, yeah. coming in, I guess it would make sense to throw some stuff their way. Yeah. Wait, uh, Austin starts this year, yet or next year, as in 2020? 2021. Oh. Oh, yeah, 2021, because I don't think they've started building that stadium yet. So it's just Miami next year? Miami or? and Nashville. That's what it was. I knew I knew there was another team that was coming yeah. in. Hard to, hard to remember. So then Austin is in 2021, and then St. Louis and Sacramento in 2022. Sac- is St. Louis is 2022? Pretty sure. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they announced back in August that St. Louis would become a franchise and play in 2022. Right. And then we don't know when team 30 is going to be it. So yeah, yeah, 2022 will be St. Louis and Sacramento. I feel like they do need a team 30 in order just to round out the numbers. Cause 29 is just weird. Yeah. 30 is going to happen eventually. I feel like S- Charlotte might be the best front runner for that, but that's a whole nother debate. Well, 
the I mean I think the the top five right now are Vegas, Charlotte, Phoenix, Indian, Raleigh, maybe. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think Vegas is probably a top candidate, and I think Vegas thinks that they're the top candidate. Yeah, which is kind of crazy considering a few years ago, like when they first got in there, MLS themselves said, no, thank you. But then they actually saw how kind of effective it was. Yeah, and then the Knights happened, and now there's that billion-dollar stadium for the Raiders. All of a sudden, Vegas is becoming a sports town. I mean, technically it was with all the gambling, but now it's actually got sports inside of it. Right. Now, um, the uh, what's it called? I don't even remember the name of it. The League's Cup. The League's Cup championship was in Las Vegas this year, too. Hmm. There you go. Exciting stuff happening in Vegas. Maybe even some MLS stuff. Maybe. Then you can go, you can go and visit and throw some money down on uh, an Orlando City Vegas Lights game. <laughs> and lose your money. Ooh, that would be fun. It's pretty exciting. Got to tell Good you. times. Good times. All right, we were talking about UCF. We we got on a weird tangent there, didn't we? That's that's what we do best here. All right, well, the men's soccer team, like I said, they play on Wednesday, November 13th at UCF, 7.30. Go out and support because they are the best team when it comes to soccer in the Central Florida area. Now, on the women's side, they're also pretty good. Not as good. They're 11-3-4 overall. Uh, they beat USF, which was number 24 in the nation most recently, and they also beat U of H, University of Houston. Uh, that was 5 nothing. They beat them on Sunday. Thursday, as in when we're recording this today, they'll be playing USF. So, unfortunately, we will not know the result by the time this, this show comes out. I'm going to assume that they win because uh, I have hope in them. So, go Knights. Hopefully they, they beat USF once again. It's going to be uh, the games in Memphis. Because Memphis was the best women's team. And then if they win this, they play on the final on Sunday the 10th. So, big game for the Knights. The Lady Knights. Because if they win, they're in, hopefully. And if they lose, they're probably uh, out. Hmm. So that's UCF on the women's side and the men's side. Now, on to Rollins very quickly because they are also hosting some pretty good teams. Men's side, not as much, but they did win their most recent game against Nova Southeastern, who they, they will be playing again on Monday the 11th in the first round of the Sunshine State Conference tournament, but their their season was uh, it it had a lot to be desired. Five seven and two overall, kind of struggled out the gate, pulled it out towards the end of the season, then then lost a couple games in overtime. Uh, their big calling card was they beat the number six team in the nation for their first loss of the season. That was Florida Tech back on uh, the twenty third of October, and they uh, they've made the tournament so that they're they're. Destiny is fully in their hands. If they win, then they keep going. If they lose, their season's over, no matter what. So best of luck to the men's team on the Rollins side. The women's team, much better. Unfortunately, they they had a great run going. I mean, they had an amazing run going. They won every single game from September 25th up until October 26th, and then they lost their last two in, in a row. They were the number five team in the nation. Now... I don't know if they're ranked yet. <laughs> like imagine imagine going going from top five to possibly unranked. Just for two games. They were eight they were perfect in the Sunshine State Conference. They were eight and oh, now they're eight and two. They were top twenty going into their last game of the season, then they lost three nothing to Nova Southeastern. Who are also not bad. They're they're you know the the second best team behind Rollins. Um, Nova actually seven one and one in conference, thirteen and two overall. So it was looking very likely that Rollins would be hosting a tournament. Now not quite as sure. Rebel. 
Yeah. Well, they're going to be starting play uh, most likely on the uh, November 11th, which is the beginning of the Sunshine State Conference Tournament. And uh, then they play on the 14th and the 17th if they win, and they continue on and on and on. So hopefully they uh, continue doing that. And that's it for uh, for all the soccer in the Orlando area. Well, actually, we forgot about the pride. Well, sorry, the active soccer active in the soccer. Orlando. All right, yeah, that's better. Now on to the teams that currently aren't in season. Let's talk about the pride. Big news from their star striker, still considered their star striker, Alex Morgan and Servando Carrasco, expecting a child in the early part of next year. Woohoo. Wow. Show some more enthusiasm, Gavin. Woohoo. There you go. There you go. Get excited. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, uh, it's very likely that Alex Morgan will not play for the Pride next year. And then who knows what her future will Woo-hoo. be after that. Yeah, it's uh, pretty much up in the air right now. At this point, being pregnant... Probably not going to see her at all next year. She says she wants to play in the Olympics, or she's still eyeing it. Which That's at the end of July, which is yeah. still very possible. If she has her kid in, what was it, May, March, April, May, sometime around there, mm-hmm. it's still very possible. You saw Sydney LaRue do it, and Alex has a, a good mentor when it comes to uh, playing after pregnancy in Sid. So it's still very possible that she is out playing a uh, new coach, for the women's national team, who, by the way, I I don't know if you know about Andronovsky, but he uh, used to be an MASL coach. Yes. Just like to to mention that he got hired out of the MASL by Kansas City, right? Yeah, he was he was actually still Seattle. coaching uh, the Kansas City Comets uh, while he was doing FC Kansas City work from uh, 2013 to 2016. So he was an assistant for the Kansas City Comets up until 2013. Then FC Kansas City came in, hired him, and then Kansas City Comets made him head coach. So he was pulling double duty up until 2017, when then he left the Comets, took over Seattle in 2018, and now he's the U.S. head coach. Kind of wild uh, career path for him, but... He's the pride of the MASL now. (laughs) Yeah, from what I understand, he's a very, uh, very detailed coach, hard worker. Seems like a very good fit for this national team. Yeah. It's kind of something that they they would need at this point. But uh, Vlatko is the new coach. I I would assume he kind of will know the uh, limitations that Alex will have. Don't know if she'll be starting any games, but she'll probably end up playing a little bit of games as long as she feels up to it. But yeah, it, it's it's not it's not Jill Ellis anymore, which means new rules apply to different players. I don't think you're just guaranteed a spot because of your name, regardless of you know coming off of injury or pregnancy or whatever. But because there is a new coach, it means that there is new opportunities for players that may not have gotten any lately, like Aubrey Bledsoe, for example very deserving has been deserving for like a year and a half now of getting a call up to the women's national team and and she's going to be getting called up so uh all credit to her she has definitely deserved it but again that comes with the new coaching staff they give players opportunities and they don't just call up the players that they're comfortable with it's a whole new ball game and she um she's from cincinnati too so we could see her play in this first game in Columbus. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Mm. Very cool. I'll never forget the time that she pranked Tom Sermani by, uh, after she had her surgery, she uh, sent her twin sister out onto practice <laughs> to uh, to fake Tom out, thinking that, like, oh, she was back to normal. <laughs> that was great. Uh, that was funny. I miss Tom. Tom's a great yeah. guy. Yeah, we all miss Tom. Speaking of, of of the pride, I I did run into uh, Mark Skinner recently and had a little chat with him. You know, he's he's very positive about next year. Still, still believes that you know this team will will uh, be better next year. We'll have different look to it next year. 
Um, but for now, the team is as it is. And, uh, well, they just announced that they're, they're bringing everyone back, basically. Yep. I don't expect that to stay the same. Like, the, the official announcement is that the Orlando Pride picked up the options on basically everyone and extended new contracts to everyone else that they didn't have a, an option for. And so a lot of people, well, they freaked out. They're like, well, what, what are you doing? This is the worst team ever in Orlando Pride history. Why are you bringing everyone back? Right, so they they op- they exercised the options on literally everyone, and then extended new contracts to Kristen Edmonds, Carson Pickett, Emily Van Egmond, and Allie Krieger, and Allie Krieger. Yes, and I know a lot of people were happy with Allie, and and yeah, she's she's somehow made the NWSL best eleven. <laughs> yeah, the very controversial NWSL best eleven, by the way. Boy, was that controversial. I mean. Players were literally, like, players who won the award, they're like, yeah, great and all, but I didn't deserve it, kind of thing. Yeah. When you when you have your players in your league doing that, you know you kind of messed up. Just saying. Now, uh, the big controversies of uh, the Pride roster was, you know, they were bad, and then they picked everyone up. I don't expect that to stay. So don't expect a lot of those players that had their options picked up to stick around because they did that last year and not everyone stuck around. There could be some trades, could be some uh, player releases, but because of the re-entry draft, they didn't want the players to go into the re-entry, so it's very easy just to pick up an option and then then kind of write it off later. Meanwhile, they did actually make a move, the Pride, because of the re-entry draft, they actually picked someone. Chloe Lazargo, who is a uh, Australia women's national team, played for the Washington Spirit. She's only 24. And, uh, yeah, she's a decent player. I don't know if she's going to be back in NWSL next year because she signed for Sydney FC in the W League. And, yeah, a lot of people expect her not to be in the league next year, but maybe Mark Skinner can convince her otherwise. She could be a very good player. At the least, they hold her rights for the NWSL if she ever wants to come back. So we'll see. I think that's it on the Pride. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Mm, nothing that comes to mind, really. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess I, I've, I've got some stories I can tell. Story time. Story time. Yeah. I, I teased it a few times Uh, what over the last couple of months. Probably. I guess it's more relevant now in a way. Because of, you know, Bob Bradley doing well and, and winning the Supporter Shield with LAFC. Uh, there was a time that he was uh, he was going to be the replacement for Adrian Heath. Do tell. Think that would have been, yeah. Well, it's like the, they, they talked to him. He was like signed and like they had everything prepared. And then... Uh, from what I was told by some folks, he just kind of didn't feel comfortable with it at the last minute and dropped out. <laughs> so they ended up with Jason Christ. Yeah. What could have been? What could have been? What could have been? I'm sure Bob is happy with the way things have worked out, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they did lose to Seattle. And he did tell a reporter to get lost, which became a meme, naturally. Anyways, uh, you, you want to hear another story? Of course. Uh, Orlando City almost had a new owner. So I've heard through some uh, some people and some uh, sources that uh, Mark Cuban was uh, inquiring about buying Orlando City. When was this? A couple of years ago. Hmm. At the time, I believe Flavio had the price at like $700 million. <laughs> So okay. that kind of threw him off. I know Mark is still interested in buying and investing in an MLS team. Yeah. The I question could, is, which one will it be? Yeah. I wonder, like, obviously Dallas immediately comes to mind, but you wonder if because of the hunts and their their long history in soccer, it's, it's if they would even a, entertain that. It's not a good investment. It's in Frisco. 
Nobody yeah. goes to the games. In well, fact. that's the thing is if you're Mark Cuban and you do this and you obviously attempt to look at moving the team closer to Dallas or the Dallas Fort Worth area. Yeah, but they just built the entire National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco. Yeah. I don't think that's happening anytime soon, even if you wanted to. There's also well, Austin. I mean, if you're the Hunts, no. If you're a brand new owner, you're going to look at making that business better. And realistically, everybody yeah, knows that Frisco is not going to be the long-term option for them. Yeah, but if you just built a brand new like Hall of Fame for the entire U.S. soccer. Yeah, but if you bought the team, you didn't build that. You would, you don't care. <laughs> You care about what's going to make your business money. People will still go to the National Soccer Hall of Fame. You don't have to destroy the stadium or the Hall of Fame. I mean, the stadium can still be there for your B team. For, um, no, North Texas FC. SC. Yeah. They do. Don't they play there, too? They do. I think they were, like, exploring moving somewhere else. Like, I I read something recently. No, no, no. They play in Arlington. Yeah. Is I read something recently about um, the ballpark at Arlington, like maybe turning that into like a soccer stadium or something. Well, the the Globe Life Park in Arlington. Yeah, that's where they're playing. Yeah, that's where they currently play their games. Well, I think they announced uh, they announced for next year they're going to be playing. So oh, it okay. doesn't look so. Then that's probably what it was. So they haven't. There hasn't been anything yet. Yeah, they they move. They're move. They announced in October that they'd be moving from Toyota Stadium where Dallas plays to the. Globe Life Park in Arlington, which is interesting because, like, why would you, why would you do that if there was not some plan? Maybe just to expand the reach of soccer in Texas. It's possible, yeah. I mean, at this point, like, Globe Life Park isn't really being used, as far as I know, right? Yeah. Because I mean, if you're FC Dallas, do you, are you just testing it? Do you see if maybe people come out here, we can move the big team here? Yeah, I don't know. They're also going to be playing the XFL games there, the Dallas Renegades. Mm, so, like, you know, yeah. football. Yeah, I'm looking at. But it's all, it's you know it's right. also a it's a it's a baseball stadium by trade. So yeah, I mean it's even like the reconfigured images don't look aesthetically pleasing. That being said, Global Life Park, like I've always really wanted to go because it looks like a really great baseball stadium. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're, the Texas Rangers are moving to Globe Life Field. Yes, that brand it's new domed stadium. Everyone needs a dome, apparently. Well, I mean, in Texas, can you really blame them? All right, you ready to get out of here? Well, we've reached. We, uh, I mean, we, before we get out of here, we really should talk about MLS Cup. Oh, uh, yeah. Did preface that earlier. Um, who you got? I'm thinking Seattle. I'm thinking Toronto. Ooh. Even I think without Josie? I think I don't know. Will will Josie be healthy? Apparently he said the other day that it would it's gonna take a small miracle for him to be on the field. I mean the Seattle at home in MLS Cup, you know that building is gonna be bouncing. I think like, I think they're it might be that they're playing mind games. Because Greg Vanny said the other day, it'll take a lot to keep him off the team. Yeah, I mean, I I thought the same thing too. Is because Josie even said after the Atlanta game that like it's a Cup final, you're gonna do whatever you can to get out there. I don't know. Seattle's don't know. Seattle's like, expecting Josie to play. Yeah, that's the thing is I think you prepare for him to play because I can't see even if it's the final thirty minutes, he's gonna be on the field. I think. He'll, he'll feature regardless, I think. And if Seattle, that first goal, if Seattle scores a goal, remember the Marshawn Lynch run that caused like an earthquake or earthquake um, effects or, you know, like it was, you know, it registered as like a literal earthquake with the how loud the stadium got. Like I feel like oh, that's yeah, going to yeah. be the same thing. Because cup, the cup already sold out, I think they said in like 10 minutes. And they're trying to get even more tickets to sell. That's going to be an awesome atmosphere. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. I mean, this isn't the first time that they've hosted an MLS Cup final in Seattle. Yeah, no, it's the first time Seattle has been in there. It was, what, LA, Real Salt Lake in like 2009 played there? Uh Uh-huh. When when MLS was doing that neutral site thing. Yeah. Which was weird. 
I, I, I like I got it from a kind of analytical standpoint because well what that was the first year of the Sounders yeah they announced it a week before their inaugural match that they would be, the final would be at the Quest Field it was Quest Field now Century League Field Century. but yeah that was that was a weird a weird time where they were doing the neutral sites and what was funny in 2009 it was Seattle and in 2010, they hosted the MLS Cup. You know where? In Los Angeles. No, in Toronto. Oh. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. It was just a weird excited. coincidence where it was Seattle, then Toronto, yeah. and then go back into MLS Cup. Who won first? Seattle. Who won the next year? Toronto. <laughs> and now part three. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Wait, what year they they got rid of the uh, they got rid of the neutral site in 2012, I think. Which at th- that point, the Galaxy were playing in like their second or third straight final, right? Yeah, basically. Then 2013 was out in Kansas City. Yeah, it, that yeah. So 2012 was the last, the first year they did non-neutral sites. Good times, good times. All right. Uh, yeah, we're done. I don't. I don't have anything else to say about anything at this point. You'll hear more from us in in the future about other stuff, but we're, we're gonna take it easy in the off season. We're not gonna do too much. So, yeah, you ready to get out of here? Yeah, I'd say. Um, well, I'm not because we forgot to talk about the Orlando Sea Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, the Orlando Sea Wolves. They have started their preseason. It's a week in, and they've got a new training facility. They moved from XL Soccer World out in Maitland to R9 Academy, which is down kind of near Millennia, LB McLeod. It's a very nice facility. Been out there a couple times, and it's uh, it's an outdoor-indoor facility. So by that, I mean it has a roof over the field, but it, it, the sides are completely open. So it's kind of an indoor facility if you want to say so it's uh it's got a good facility uh the good amenities it's got a training room it's got a film room locker room a lot of stuff that xl didn't have so sea wolves are happy about that and happy to have a, a nice training facility that they can go to and uh enjoy it and um yeah, they started their new training camp. They announced their new head coach, which is their GM, Chris Gocalis. Uh Tom Traxler stepped down to pursue upper other opportunities, and that's pretty much it. They got a fan fest coming up Sunday, November 17th. Free tickets. If you go online, you just got to go to the uh, Orlando Seawolf website and go to 2019 Fan Fest, which is right on the top of their website, and register. Free food free stuff being given out and then a free game to watch as the Seawolves will take on their reserve side. Get excited, folks. Woohoo. First game of the season is November 22nd and we'll be giving away some free tickets. 15 days away. Well, 14 by the time this comes out. Now we're done. Woohoo. <laughs> Never heard you so excited. All right. That's another show done in the books. Thanks for tuning in to another one of these Orlando soccer shows. Say we don't know when we'll see you again. Maybe after Orlando hires its new coach. Uh, maybe after Orlando makes some roster decisions, whatever comes first. Um, I'll be covering the women national team in Jacksonville this weekend. Austin will be covering the men's national team in Orlando next week. So there's that at least. Well, we'll probably do a, a show after that to recap it all. Yeah, yeah, we probably could. Um, you know, like you, like Austin was saying, plenty of live soccer to get to if you want to go to the college games. I mean, like that's, I'm excited to go to this national team game because it's like the first live soccer I've been to in a couple months. So it's, it's been a while. I'm excited to just go go watch. Yeah, maybe interview some players. And yeah, see what we to- can uh, get out of Ashlyn Harris after the game. Maybe talk to her a little bit. Yeah, there you go. All right, that's going to do it for the, another edition of the Orlando Soccer Show. That's Gavin Eubank. I'm Austin David, and we will leave you with Macho Man Randy Savage.
From the tower of power, too sweet to be sour, I'm funky like a monkey, sky's the limit and space is the place.